hi beautiful people um this is prophetess elizabeth i just wanted to go ahead and continue the series that i started um if any one of you guys weren't able to see the last video that i posted um the name of the series is unlocking purpose so the first video that i posted was about what is purpose so i did an explanation and a definition of just what is purpose um according to the Bible, the Holy Spirit. Um, and as far as this video, I'm going to be speaking about identity. So basically, I'm going to go over different parts of what creates your identity through the Bible. So I'm going to be using scripture. Um, before I go ahead and get started, um, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please go ahead and do so. Um, I really appreciate all the people that do take time to watch this video because this is Holy Spirit inspired and this is Bible inspired. Um, this is something that I take time to prepare before presenting before you guys. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick prayer. Lord, I just thank you, Father God, for your holy name. For your Holy Spirit, Lord, and I just pray that even now, Father God, that you reveal your identity through us, Lord, that you reveal your identity to us, Lord God, and that each person, Father God, that may feel discouraged, Lord God, about their identity and their purpose, Lord God, that you will begin to touch them even now from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet, Father God. May there be revelation and wisdom that is being unlocked right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I give you all the honor and all the glory, Lord, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will empower me to speak everything according to your will and purpose about identity, Father God. I give you all the praise and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I just wanted to start off with a prayer, just asking the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. Um, I just, um, so for example, I just, I'm going to go over different types of identity, um, because you have an identity in Jesus Christ. You have an identity as far as your natural purpose. You have an identity as far as your spiritual purpose. And one thing that I am going to touch on is the identity as even as an intercessor, because I do believe that some people are called to pray more than some. We're all called to pray, but there's some of us that may not have been um, graced to pray for a certain periods of time, but that doesn't disqualify you because God is not concerned um, with the time. It's more of your sincerity of your heart. So it's just like the Bible tells you to not to ramble. You know, some people, they ramble as you're praying. I mean, and then it might be someone that's just praying from their heart. So that's two different things because that person is praying from their heart, from their, from the spirit, not their flesh. Okay. So the Bible tell, tells us that our identity in Christ is a part of accepting his gift of eternal life through faith. Jesus gave himself as a living sacrifice. He died on the earth and then he rose on the third day. So he conquered death he conquered death by him resurrecting and that's the same ability that he gave us that's why you have seen testimonies where um people are pastors preachers um men and women of god praying for other people that are that that are um that are pronounced dead but then the resurrection power of jesus christ touches them and then they're healed because we see jesus doing that in the bible where he was able to go to a couple places even with lazarus and he prayed he just spoke the word and then lazarus he didn't take hours of prayer for lazarus to come from the dead he just spoke the word and it was established so when I think about Jesus, Jesus understood his identity. Jesus understood his assignment. So when you understand your identity and understand who you are, you understand that you don't have to do things the way everyone else does. You understand that Jesus Christ came and he died for your sins. You understand that he lives through you and that he is the one that took on death and sickness on himself and that was the whole purpose of his sacrifice that he made on the cross on the tree um so i reflect on jesus lifestyle and i'm saying that with jesus he shows us that he is he is the one that sets the example for us yes we can look at other men and women of god we can even look at other people that are in the bible but the number one person that we should always look on as an example because he did it within three years he showed us how we should go about ministry and go about life because even though jesus was the son of god he was also known as a carpenter's son 
So he had a natural gift. He was able to do carpentry. But then even as he was a son of God. So even as you are called in the fivefold ministry, that doesn't that doesn't mean that you can't have a job. I mean, some people reach a point where they have businesses and then they're doing ministry. So people have to be careful that you're not just sitting down and you're not saying that, oh, well, I'm in ministry. I don't need to work. And then God is telling you, no, you have a natural gift. So use the natural gift until I prepare you to place you where I need to place you. Stop trying to go ahead of God and wait on God to lead you to do something. Um, I wanted to go ahead and read 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26 through 27. It says, says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. So even though you have an individual purpose, you have an individual identity, that doesn't mean that you should separate yourself from the body of Christ. That doesn't mean that if someone else is having victory or someone else is able to overcome something in the church or even within your family that you shouldn't feel that you shouldn't rejoice for that person's success. A lot of times people get envious or they get jealous and some people, they may not like that, that word, but it is what it is. There will be jealousy. There will be suffering. There will be hatred. And these are all things that we saw in the Bible. These are all things we saw Jesus experiencing because even though he was the son of God, he was still rejected. He was still, people still didn't like him. They didn't like his wisdom. They didn't like the fact that he understood so much about the Bible. They definitely didn't like the fact that he only, you, you got to think, this is someone that's supposed to be a, a, a known as a carpenter's son. This is someone that is, is known as someone that they saw that was just walking about growing like everyone else. And then now he knows the Bible more than them. Now he's telling them about the law of Moses. Now he's telling them that I'm the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. So when you are walking in your identity, a lot of people will not understand. A lot of times they will say, well, how is it that this guy or how is it that this girl got into this position so quickly how is it that this person got built up in ministry so quickly how is it that this person got built up in um in business so quickly how is it that this person got built up in education so quickly but they don't understand that even though they're just seeing you now god was already developing you god was already speaking to you god was already using the holy spirit and his angels to mold you into who he calls you to be. So even though they saw Jesus now, they saw him in these three years of him doing his ministry because it was this, it was the appointed time for him to step into his identity. They didn't understand that Jesus was already being prepared because there were moments even at 12 years old that he went to the synagogue and he was sitting amongst the wise men in the temple. So a lot of times people don't see the journey that you're coming from. They only see the position that you're in. So when you're walking into your identity, don't be focused on the noise. Don't be focused on who think that you didn't, you don't deserve something because who are they to tell you that you deserve to walk in your identity? When God says he, God even told Jeremiah, he said, I knew you from your mother's womb. He knew Jeremiah before he even placed him in his mother's womb. God knew you before he even placed you in his mother's womb because he's the one that prepared you for your mother's womb. He's the one that prepared your mother to carry you. He could have chose any other woman in the world, but he said, no, I'm going to choose this woman because there's something in this woman that can carry this child. So a lot of times when people say that they don't understand your identity, do you understand your roots? Do you understand your mother? Do you understand your father? And even if you grew up with a single parent, that doesn't disqualify you from walking in to your purpose. So don't be focused on what you don't have. Focus on what you have. In Jesus name. Hallelujah. And then when you look at even um, one of the richest scriptures in the Bible, it says Ephesians 1 verse 3 through 14. It talks about identity because Paul is addressing the church in Ephesians, explaining the new identity given to a person when they are in Christ. So when you are in Christ, you are no longer who you used to be. And I'm reminded of Rahab when Rahab was, um, was helped 
helped Joshua and his army. Basically, he helped um she helped Joshua two spies that he sent in before he before the he led the children of Israel in to take over the land. He Joshua you, Joshua was able to have the favor of God because he was a man that walked in obedience. He wasn't moved by his enemies. He wasn't moved by the distraction and the noise of those that were more powerful than him. He understood that God was more powerful than those because he even when the scripture says that my grace is sufficient in your time of weakness. So Joshua had a time of weakness where he had to depend on God. His spies, his two spies that went inside of the inside of the land that they needed to possess they understood their assignment they understood their identity they understood that it was the Lord God Almighty that was leading them into this land to take it over and they and then God gave them favor with Rahab and in the end they kept their word and Rahab was even a great grandmother of David and 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 a lot of times, if anyone knows about Rahab, Rahab was also known as a prostitute. She was known as one of the lowest type of women. But yet here we see that in the Bible through Hebrews and reading different scriptures that Rahab was a mother a great grandmother of even David and he was even connected in the line and she was connected in the lineage of Jesus Christ through her obedience. Because she could have been destroyed and her own whole household could have been destroyed because of disobedience. Because she didn't do what was right. And in that moment when Rahab had those two spies in front of her, she and them made a deal. So a lot of you, you have to make sure that you're being sensitive. Don't be so caught up in your, in your, cause what if Rahab was more caught up in his, in, in her country or where she came from or the people around her, then she would have missed the new that God had for her. So when you get so caught up in where you're coming from, you get so caught up in your environment, then you're unable to hear the, the voice of God and what he was leading her to do. Because yes, this was a woman that wasn't in the lineage of Israel, but through marriage, through Boaz, through David, she was able to enter into the promise because she did something that any a lot of other women would have never done. Some people would have went and go tell the king or, or tell the other army and snitch. And then when it all come down to it, God would have still got the glory because he would have still went into that land with Joshua and all the rest of his army and still slay them. But then she would have missed the promise because she wouldn't have known how to speak. She would have she wouldn't have known how to hold her mouth. And sometimes what interferes with some of us identity is our mouths. Because then you're going around telling everyone what you're doing. You're going around telling everyone what's your purpose. You're going around telling everyone, oh, I'm traveling here. I'm applying for this visa. I'm applying to this country. And then this is the delay. Sometimes it's our mouth. And that's something that God had to, the Holy Spirit had to deal with me like, I, I'm not a talkative person, but I have a, you know, a, a handful, a handful, literally, handful of people that I keep close to me because you can't do ministry alone. You can't do life alone. So I do believe that you have to have your people around you. But one thing that I had to learn, even the people around me, I'm very selective in what I share to them because sometimes I share things to certain ones and I know that certain things start happening to me. And I'm like, okay, God, this doesn't, why am I not moving? Because now you told me to do this. And then I have to reflect. And the Holy Spirit had to tell me, he said, listen, evaluate your circle. Are, is every single person around you happy for you every time that you conquer something? Because people can say what they want to say, but God knows their heart. So sometimes you experience delay because you have people around you that doesn't feel joy over every single thing that you are doing you know sometimes they're wondering like why am i not why didn't i get this why my life isn't this way but they don't understand the process that you had to go through you know they don't understand that when they were having fun you were the one studying when they were having fun you were the one that was single when they were have when you know so sometimes they want to know why is it that you're married i have experienced this i'm giving you a, like a, a little snippet of my life 
Um, so sometimes they're, you know, they wonder like, okay, why am I, why am I married? But then they don't understand that I was single for like four years. They don't understand the journey of preparation. I was single. I was, I wasn't intimate with anyone for years. And so when everyone else was going out and dating and when everyone else was getting prepared for marriage, I was the single one, you know, so that was a form of preparation because God was doing something inside of me. He was teaching me things about myself. So when I do get married, I don't lose myself because sometimes marriage, it can, it can mold you. It, it not sometimes it will mold you and it will humble you. So a lot of times people are praying for marriage and they don't understand the process that you have to go through in marriage. Even though God prepared me for marriage, that doesn't mean that I know everything about marriage. So like when someone is, is so open, like I kind of get like, I'm like, when I hear people that try to give so many marriage advices and then you're not married, I kind of don't understand that theory. I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit can give us wisdom. But the wisdom that you're given, it comes with a price because you yourself will have to go through that process in order for that grace to be upon the word that you're giving other people. So a lot of times God allows us to go through things because he needs us to understand that you're not going to be the one that's just saying all these things and you don't even understand the process. So a lot of times, me personally, I will give advice to, for people to marriage, but that's like, if you ask me, I'm not someone that's going to act like I know everything about marriage because I don't, you know, everything is a learning experience. I like to listen to people that's been married for 15, 20 years, because I feel like those are the people that know what they're talking about. Even if you've been married for five or 10 years, yes, I'll still listen to you. But I'm saying that when you see someone that's been married for 20, 30, 40 years, they went through a serious process. This is not something that they just was given. They, they went through the process. Yes, the grace of God is upon them. But with marriage, you have to make a conscious decision to know that through the good and the bad, through debt do its part, that you are going to stay through that process. And and you you yourself can't be the only one. It's, it's two ways. I don't know. I'm being led to talk about marriage. But the Holy Spirit knows your purpose and he knows your identity. So a lot of times... People have to be careful that you're not trying to force or give yourself to someone that's not a part of your identity, not a part of your purpose. Because a lot of times, if you get connected to a man or to a woman that is the opposite sex, that is not a part of your purpose, not a part of your identity, or don't even understand your purpose or identity, then throughout your marriage, you're going to have to be fighting about your identity. And that's one thing that I am grateful to God for is that before I got married, I understood my assignment. I understood my identity. But then you might, you may be a man or a woman that now you are finding out your identity in marriage. And that's why I always tell every single person that ever asks me anything about marriage. I said, please know your identity before you get into marriage because you don't want to lose yourself in the process of marriage. And this is something that a lot of people feel like they have to get a divorce in order to walk in your identity. I, I mean, in the scriptures, the only, the only reason why a man or a woman should get, um, a divorce is because of adultery. And also if that person has been abusive, if you've been in an abusive marriage or relationship, okay, completely agree with you exit the building. But if, if, or, or if it's something to do with adultery, you have, the Bible tells you, you have a right to, you have a right to forgive. We should forgive, but at the same time, you must know the reason why. If that person is doing it consistently, that person has a change, you have prayed about it, then you, then it's, it's time to exit out the building as well. So at the same time, because that person can be dealing with perversion and that's the reason why they may need deliverance. So you may even want to bring your spouse, if they're willing to even go see someone that's a, um, a, a deliverance minister, a spiritual person that, um, a pastor or someone that's calling the fivefold and even a woman or a man of God that can pray for them, for them to go to deliverance of the spirit of perversion. And also you going through this deliverance of spirit of perversion, because a lot of people, they think that once you get married and Okay, you can be dating. I have heard people tell me like, oh, I was I was with this person for 20 years and then they got married and then they get a divorce because I like to listen to other people. I'm not someone that just act like, you know, I like to listen. I teach and um, I preach the word of God, but at the same time, I, I listen and I hear what other people, I don't always have to go through what someone has gone through to learn from them. 
Um, and that's, that's, you have to walk in a spirit of humility because sometimes God can send other people to you to show you how to avoid certain situations. Um, so a lot of times people think that, oh, well, you know, I've heard people, they say they was dating for 20 years, they get married and they get a divorce a year or two years later. Why, why is that? Because there is a spiritual battle against marriages. When you're married to someone, it's different from when you're dating someone or when you have a child with someone and you're, and you was outside of the will of God. Because when you're not married and you have, and you're doing certain things, you're, you are outside of your will of God. Of course, I have done things like that. I have been in the world. You know, I'm no longer in the world because I have, um, the Holy Spirit has transformed my life and I've asked Jesus Christ for forgiveness, but that doesn't, um, disqualify you from receiving the promise. And that goes back to identity because when you know your identity in Jesus Christ, you don't sit down and, and dwell on those things. But at the same time, we have to take responsibility for our actions. We have to take accountability. So even when you're getting married, there is spiritual warfare. There, You hear a lot of times where people are saying, oh, I only was married for four months. I was only married for a year. And then they're getting a divorce. Why is that? Because there's spiritual warfare. The the devil doesn't want and spirit, and, and the demons and all these things that are assigned against you. They, they, those spirits don't want you to stay in a healthy marriage. Those spirits don't want you to forget about your past. That's Those spirits don't want you to forget about your childhood. And that's where you have to understand understand that your identity and understand even the identity for your marriage, that, that marriage is holy and mar marriage is righteous. And really there's no, there's no reason to walk out of a marriage if it's not adultery or abuse. And that's just where I stand with that because I have read the scriptures numerous times, study the scriptures to know that God does not like divorce. And he wants us to be holy and separated. If you have been someone that have dealt with divorce because of adultery or because of abuse, then God is merciful because those were not your choices. And if you probably were the one that was a part of it or you the one who did those things, you have to forgive yourself and, and, and seek healing from the Holy Spirit or even other people to counsel you and that you can get to the root of the issue and be delivered from that spirit and have a change within your life in Jesus name. Because that could be a, you're dealing, you could be dealing with a spirit of perversion or a spirit of anger. And these are things that you have to be able to face it. And so God can heal you. Um, I do feel that the Holy Spirit is speaking to someone. So this is not a, a message of con, condemn, condemnation. This is a message of conviction through the Holy Spirit. All right. So when we're walking in identity, see yourself as God sees you. If we live out our identity based on how God sees us, we no longer feel the need to find our worth in external circumstances. So even when you understand the way that God sees you and you begin to see yourself the way that God sees you, then you are no longer placed in a box of how people see you, how even how um, your spouses, your family member, your friends, anyone that's in your life or outside of your life, you're no longer able to see them. They're no longer able to see you the way that God sees you. Because you don't see yourself the way that God sees you. How can other people see you that way? If you don't walk in that confidence, and when you're walking in your identity, you have to be confident. When I'm speaking about the word of God, I can't question myself because now I'm questioning the Holy Spirit. I'm questioning how God is showing me the word and I'm not depending on myself to preach the word or to teach the word. I'm depending on the Holy Spirit that's inside of me to empower me to get the revelation, to be able to speak the word of God. So even when you're going to going into your job, your career, you're still able to understand that it is the grace of God that's empowering you to do these things. Um, I noticed that even when I'm in, the, when I was teaching, when I'm teaching in the classroom, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit, um, leading me, you know, even when you're a first year teacher, that's one of the hardest years 
that I experienced because you don't know anything, but then I had to depend on the grace of God. Yes, my teammates and I had good leadership um, in the school, but at the same time, I still had to, there were moments I'll just go in my classroom and I'll just sit down when, when it was break time and I'll just sit down and just pray because I needed the Holy Spirit to give me peace throughout the day. I needed to pray for the kids because a lot of them, you know, there were things that they that I seen in the spirit that I had to pray against in their lives. So a lot of times God will even use your identity in Christ to empower you to do your natural gifts, to do your natural purpose. So, so there's no way to separate any part of your life. That's just like if you're a mother or if you're a father, your identity can form who your child will become in the future. Things that you have done in the past, if you haven't asked God for forgiveness or close those doors or make those changes, can even affect your child being able to repeat those cycles. A lot of times when you see someone that has dealt with um, anger, you see that these things are happening throughout generation. When you see someone that's dealing with perversion, you see that these things are repeating itself throughout the family line. And when you are walking in your identity in Christ, you understand and you are able to identify these cycles in your family. We all have to do that. I have I've done that. I've sat down and saw certain cycles in my family and I had to pray against it. You may even come from a family where you're always seeing divorce. That doesn't mean that you have to be the one to get a divorce. And if you have gotten a divorce, that don't mean you have to have another divorce when you do get married again. It's a choice that you have to make. So when you understand your identity, you understand that even your children identities are connected to your identity. And that's the reason why God chooses who he, who he allows to carry you in their womb. He, God chose who your mother, your father. Yes, we have free will, but all in all, he had to choose, you know what, this little girl or this little boy, I'm going to place right here because I feel like this is something that's going to connect. And yes, you may be someone that didn't grow up with a mother or you didn't grow up with a father, but God still had a purpose because you still needed those DNA. You still needed those genetics. You still needed that bloodline to be who you are created to be. And not that we should accept every single thing that comes from our bloodline, because I do believe that we have to renounce things and we're called to be a change and a deliverer within our families. And we're not the only ones that's called to do that, but there's other intercessors, other people, other prayer people that are within our families that are gonna make a difference. I know my grandma was the one that made a difference within my family. And I feel like she's the one who planted the seed in my life um, to, to be God fearing, to pray. Yes, I didn't get it all at once because as a child, I was very rebellious, but as years and years and, and, and time went by, I became someone that feared God and understood God. And I reflect on the things that she taught me. And throughout my life, I have seen other people God has sent into my life. Um, I have my spiritual mother. I have my birth mother. I have different people that God has placed into my life. I have aunts. I have people that I, I respect and honor that have planted seeds into my life. Men and women of God that have planted seeds into my life throughout my lifetime and um so it's a process your identity is a process it doesn't happen overnight there's a process that you have to go through there's a process of molding that god has to go that that has that he has to bring you through so even though i understand my identity i understand my assignment there's still a process because as i said earlier jesus had to go through a process and I'm going to read Genesis 1 verse 27. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created in, created he him. Male and female created them. So God created a man. He created a woman. You are created, created an image of God. Even if you're a man, you're created an image of God. If you're a woman, you're created in the image of God. Because Jesus, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be in each one of us. Men are women. He didn't just send it to be in men. He didn't just send it to be in women. He said that he has sent it. And just because you're someone that's not standing on the pulpit, that doesn't mean you doesn't you don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you. God can be using you in any any realm of the. He could be using you in any form of job or business because he has the Holy Spirit that's inside of you. So as soon as you accepted Jesus Christ. As your Lord and Savior, you were empowered with the Holy Spirit. And um, I do want to go over the different types of gifts because I believe that 
even as I'm speaking about them, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will begin to remove the scale off of your eyes and that you will be able to see in the spirit realm who you are and who you are called to be. And just because you are called and identify as something, that doesn't mean that you won't have to wait. Because even with me, I am waiting on certain things that God has promised me um, to do because I know that it's a process and I know that even as I'm waiting he's building my character he's building your character through the process even when you are able to identify who you are you, there's a character building that you have to go through okay so you have apostles um I'm gonna go over the ident um the fivefold ministry because even as some some of you are called in the fivefold ministry, so you might hear that I'm gonna show you um say certain character character traits and you can research it as well. Study the scriptures, look at the, the twelve disciples, look at the walk of Jesus, study the prophets, look through the Bible and see these different people and see how they relate to you and just pray that the Holy Spirit reveals to you. With me, I had to pray, I had to fast, I had to get into the presence of God. And usually when I um, seek God for something, he always answers me. But it's because I, I sit there and I wait. I don't go to anyone else. I sit and I wait. And then as I'm sitting and waiting, then eventually it might take a couple days. It might even take a week. He begins to show me what I'm asking him. So sometimes we just have to be patient. Okay, because that's one of the fruit of the Spirit. God can be teaching you patience. The Holy Spirit can be teaching you patience. Okay, so apostle, they govern. So an apostle is one call sent by Christ and given the spiritual authority, character, gifts, and ability to reach people and establish them in the kingdom. So someone can be called to be an apostle because you're called to build churches. You're called to build ministries your call to be someone that not only have your own church but you're going out and you're helping other people to build up their ministries you're going out and you're going to other countries and you're helping them to build up their churches so you're an apostle you're the sent one so even the 12 disciples if you notice a lot of them they had multiple churches that they were going to they had multiple people that they were preaching they didn't always have a a, a place where it was an actual church sometimes they were going out and they were ministering out in tents and ministering out in front of people in open areas. So when you're an apostle, you're the sent one. Jesus sent his disciple, sent his apostle. He sent the disciple, the twelve disciples out to fulfill his purpose, his will on earth. So when you're an apostle, you're not only called to build your own build the ministry that God has placed inside of you, you are called to build others. You are called to help others in the churches because you see even with the Apostle Paul that he was always writing letters to the different churches, the Corinthians, the Ephesus church. He was always speaking to different churches because he was an apostle. He was sent to them to put things in order. When you are an apostle, you are called to put things in order. You are called to put the body of Christ in order. So an apostle has to be someone that has that organize, um, I would say an organizational skill where, where, where the Holy Spirit has graced them to put things in order, to put the church in order. That's why when you notice certain people, they always want to tell um, other people how to do things. And, and throughout time, I'm not saying if God has called you to be an apostle, you're just going to run because even as an apostle, I believe that you should be someone that knows how to operate in the prophetic, in healing. In preaching or teaching the word, you should be someone that is um, ha definitely have confidence, but also has have humility because you should be as an apostle, you should be functioning in all the gifts, all the offices in the body of Christ. So if you're an apostle, you should be able to preach, to, to, to operate in the gift of healing. Um, you should be someone that's operating in the prophetic as well. So you should, an apostle should be able to function in all these different gifts. And that's why God calls them the sent one, because they're the one that is sent out to put things in order, even within the church. And then now I'm prophets. So when you're someone that's a prophet, you usually, you should only be speaking what you see, what you hear, what you feel. But I know that even as a prophet, sometimes God will even allow you to make decrees and then he will answer those decrees because of the anointing, the grace that you carry. 
Um, a prophet reveals God's heart to his people, giving guidance to individuals and the body, um, giving revelation, as well as often interpretation. If you're a prophet and you're speaking in tongues, there should be some form of interpretation. If I speak in tongues, I am going to speak words and so people can understand me because I'm getting, I'm downloading what the Holy Spirit is giving me. Um, application and timing. When you're a prophet, you should know the seasons and time. A lot of times the Holy Spirit will give me a word and he doesn't allow me to, to re, um, release it until a year, two years later. And sometimes I don't release it. I just write it down and I pray over it. It's times where God has shown me things that are going to happen and even in this nation. Um, different wars that were coming. I had, a, I had a vision of seeing a war that was coming to America. I saw people being on the borders trying to come into America. This was about three years ago. And, but yet now I'm seeing that these things are happening because God is giving me that confirmation that this is, this is something that will happen. You know, so a lot of times we have to, as a prophet, you have to be careful that you're not releasing words earlier because then the Holy Spirit can be developing something inside of you because God wants to know that he can trust his prophets. You shouldn't be someone that's so quick to speak. Not because God gave you the revelation. Now you have to go ahead and talk about it. And even though God gave me that revelation like three years ago, I still didn't tell anyone around me, even the closest people to me, I didn't repeat it. Because it wasn't the time for it. Now I feel, now the Holy Spirit is telling me that it is the time for it. And even as even as I have said it, it doesn't mean that it's gonna happen in this very second because God knows He controls the timing. As a prophet, I should be praying against certain things, not accepting it. And I know that um we can't overshadow what God wants. You know, if God says this is what's gonna happen, that's what's gonna happen. But at the same time, as an intercessor, we are all called to pray against even things that we see sometimes that are in the spirit realm, or even petition, or even ask the Holy Spirit, ask ask the Holy Spirit to allow it to not happen in this very moment, that it that it will be delayed or that it will never happen. God has given us that authority as his children to speak these things. Um, so I do believe that, um, yes, God can show you something as a prophet or even as an intercessor, because we have prophetic intercessors that are, that are intercessors that God open up their eyes. So even as they begin to pray, God reveals things to them. So a lot of times people, um, even as a prophet, you may not always feel that you, you fit in everywhere. You might not be the one that they call the social butterfly all the time. And then there are some prophets that are very social, um, but it just depends on who, you know, they're, the people that God has called them to be. God uses our personalities and he knows our strengths and he knows our weaknesses. So he'll allow you to go to the people that he has called you to. And maybe you do have to be that social butterfly, even though as a prophet, you should be in the face of God more than you're in the face of people because how can you hear from God? How can you be able to know what he wants you to do in that season if you're not, if you don't have a relationship with God? And every single person that I'm speaking about, as far as the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, you should always be in the face of God. Yes, pastors and evangelists are um, more out there, and I'll go over evangelists now. Um, evangelists, those are the ones that they, they're grace. I'm not going to say they're the only ones because I feel like if you're an apostle, you're a prophet, you're a teacher, you're a pastor, you should be always speaking about winning souls. You should have a desire to win souls for the kingdom of God. But at the same time, the evangelist is grace. This is their office. This is something that we should appreciate for the body of Christ because I love the evangelists because they're the ones that are going out and bringing people in and winning souls for the kingdom of God. And that's one of the most important assignment that every single believer should have. Even if you're not called in the fivefold ministry, you are called to win souls for the kingdom of God. It, it don't matter if you're on your job. It doesn't matter where you're at. Some people, they don't want you to talk about religion. They don't want you to talk. I'm not talking. I don't believe in that you should let other people feel uncomfortable. But if I know that the Holy Spirit is leading me to say something, I will not hesitate because I am accountable to God before I'm accountable to man. So a lot of you, God has called you to even to speak to people, encourage people at your job, not to say that you're going to go out there and make other people feel uncomfortable, but sometimes you do have to be, you do have to be the one that's the oddball or the 
be the one that's making everybody feel uncomfortable to be in walking in obedience. Obedience doesn't always feel good. I'm pretty sure when Jesus was walking up to get crucified, that didn't feel good. You know, that didn't feel good to him, but he did what he had to do because he was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. He was thinking about the people that he has called us to speak to. So everything that Jesus did, it was never in vain. And whatever God has called you to do, it shall not be in vain. So don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that is the reason why he has called each one of us. It is not the gospel of you or me or the gospel of our arrogance or our pride it is the gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ. It is about Jesus Christ. It is not about you. And when you see men and women of God that have fallen from that message, that is very dangerous because now they feel like it's the message about them and it's not the message about you. It is a message about God. Okay, so an evangelist carries a great burden for those who are unsaved. They carry an anointing to preach to teach the gospel of them that comes with great conviction. So uh, evangelists have that spirit, or that grace, that even when they speak to you, you feel convicted. Even when they're speaking to the unbeliever, they have this grace that people, they, they begin to, um, they, the people around them will begin to be convicted and want to give their life to Jesus Christ because it's just the way that they preach, they teach. Everyone else can be saying the same exact thing that the evangelist is saying, but then the evangelist just has this grace. They have that anointing to win souls for the kingdom of God. That's what God has called them, ordained them to be. We see a lot of great evangelists um, in America, even in different parts of the world. Billy Graham, um, Oral Roberts, Catherine Coleman. These are all great evangelists that we have seen. And it's so many others. Like the list goes beyond what we can even imagine. We see that they just have this grace that there are any, a lot of times I notice with evangelists, they always have a healing grace as well. Like when they, even though God is using them to win souls, they, they always are able to be led by the spirit to bring healing. God uses them and have angels around them to send out the, the, the healing so people can be delivered and heal as well and give their life to Jesus Christ. Because people like to see signs and wonders and even though they want to see signs and wonders, we have to be careful that we're not signed and signs and wonders crazy, that we're not able to understand when people are using different spirits um, to be able to to do to you know to to function in 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 giftings like they're using marine spirit they're using um witches they're using divination they're using familiar spirit and those spirits are not of god because they want to be more anointed or want to look more powerful or look like they can resurrect and they could do this and they could do that um don't don't allow anyone to make you question your identity just because you may be um, a pastor and you don't you don't preach the way that everybody else do. You may be a prophet, you don't prophesy the way everybody else do. You may be an evangelist, you don't win souls the way everybody else do. You might be an apostle, a teacher, you don't do things the way everyone else does it. But that doesn't mean that you have to do bad things or go outside of the will of God to gain anointing or to gain power to do it the way that they do it. Because Jesus himself said that we shall do greater works. Every single thing that is in the word of God, God has commanded you. God has given you the ability to Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit that's living inside of you, for you to be able to operate in those gifts. So when you begin to question your identity, that is why a lot of people go out and now they start dabbling into different things. Now they need their church to be a certain wavelength. They need their church to be bigger than everyone else. They need to have this type of money coming in. They need to operate in these type of giftings. But then if it's not the Holy Spirit, this is the type of thing that even um, the Bible says that how a lot of them will say that um, I, I cast out demons. I prayed for, I, I did, um, I did heal and I did signs and wonders in your name, Jesus. But Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. So a lot of people, but God will use everything for his glory because the gift come without repentance. So all these people that think you're fooling God, you're, you, if you could see their heart, you will see that it is so dark because they say that they're calling the fivefold. And at one point, some of them were calling the fivefold, but they lost their way. And, and I just pray for their souls even now that God will bring them to a place of repentance because we're not here to condemn anyone. But I pray that God will touch their hearts and we should pray for them, that God will bring them to a place of repentance. But at the same 
same time, I know that God doesn't play, you know, because if you keep on playing with fire, you will get burned. So all these ones that don't want to repent, they want to think that they're even greater than God that created them. How can you be greater than someone that created you? You know, and those are the people that God will humble in these times because you will see a lot of them that are going to be exposed. Um, That is one of the words that the Spirit of the Lord gave me in the beginning of this year. He says, I'm going to expose some things. I'm going to reveal some things to people about these, these so-called men and women of God that have lost their way. And even some of them that are not even calling the fivefold, but they just want to open their mouth all the time. And, and we need to be careful that we're not always speaking against God's people because he doesn't appreciate that. Because if you keep speaking, that's why he says, I, I don't have to fight against other people. I don't have to talk about people. Because there's some people, they like to come on your page, they monitor you, they take things off your page, um, and then they go post it, or they hear what you have to say on your video, and then they go back and go post it. And that's what goes back to discernment. Even if you're called into the fivefold, even if you're called to be an intercessor, you need to have discernment. And that's something that I'm going to pray about before um, I finish this teaching. Okay, so pastors, pastors, um, they keep the flock healthy and safe. The pastors are usually social. They're usually the ones that usually, I don't want to say they're all, but usually they're the heart of the church. They're the one that keep, they're the shepherds of the flock. God trusts them with their flock and we need pastors. Um, we need their giftings. We need their teachers, teachings. We need them to keep the people in the church because they have that grace to be able to understand the people and, and, and talk to the people and teach them. And they have the revelation to be able to go into the word of God and teach the people what God desires to do it even in that season so we do need prophetic pastors we need people pastors that are sensitive and we do have some of them but we're praying that god will even continue to equip them and even release more prophetic pastors in jesus name um teachers um they teach and edify the church make the members of the body more hungry for the word of god teachers they come with a lot of revelation a lot of wisdom a lot of understanding teachers um they may not be the most um loudest person in the room but they but they come with a lot of wisdom um in jesus name and we even see that in acts 18 verse 24 a mighty man in the scriptures so a teacher is someone that understand and have revelation of the scriptures of the word of god hallelujah jesus so i'm just going to go ahead and go into prayer um and i just give god all the honor and all the grace thank you for his grace for allowing me to deliver this word and i pray that you will receive whatever you need to receive and that you will not accept whatever you didn't need to accept because um that goes back to discernment. What is it that the Holy Spirit needed you to receive over this video? Because um, even though I was talking about identity, I felt him leading me to different prophetic words that someone needed to hear. Um, Lord, I just pray, Father God, for your holy name and for your Holy Spirit. I just pray, Lord God, for restoration over each one of your people right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Father God, for giving us the understanding of identity, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that this word is not limited by what you have allowed me to teach. But Father God, I pray, Lord God, that even as this person begins to seek you, Lord God, that you will be able to identify yourself in them, Lord God, through the Holy Spirit. I pray i prophesy over your life that this year this season that you will begin to see your identity and that those around you will begin to even confirm your identity that even as you're walking in the grocery store that there will be people that will walk up to you and begin to say woman of god man of god there is something about you and that even as we know that prophecy comes in parts there is still um people that can give you different pieces of the puzzle. So even as prophecy is like a puzzle that comes with different parts, you know that your identity, some of you have an idea of your identity, but I believe in this season that God is going to begin to unlock your identity. He's going to begin to reveal it to you more in Jesus name. I prophesy over your life that you are getting, receiving a fresh wind of anointing for your for whatever you have been called, whether you've been called to be an apostle, you've been called to be an evangelist, you've been called to be a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, an intercessor, a believer. We are all identified to be believers of Jesus Christ, but I declare and decree that you will walk with the grace of an evangelist to begin to evangelize the gospel of Jesus Christ 
that even as you're in your job, that God will give you the grace through the Holy Spirit to begin to speak and that people will be convicted by the Holy Spirit. I declare and decree that you are walking in your identity in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare and decree that you are walking and seeing yourself the way that God wants you to see yourself. I declare and decree that God is beginning to show you your purpose, your design, the one that he has created you to do within the earth, You're the assignment that he has given you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray for those that have the desire to get married, that you, your marriage will not be a stigma to your purpose. I declare and decree that your marriage will form your identity, that your marriage will be a, a part of who God has called you to be, but it will not destroy your purpose. I declare and decree that you are being stirred up with a new fire in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus. I pray, Lord God, over your precious people, Lord, and I give you all the honor and all the glory, Father God. May you give them fresh revelation, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding for their identities through you, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that they will not feel that any gift that you have placed within them is invaluable, but they will see the value within themselves and even others around them, that they will be encouragers for those around them. And I declare and decree that if anyone around them is covetous, Lord, or jealous, Lord, or anyone that is holding them back, Father God, I declare and decree that you will not share your dreams and vision to every single person around you, because it's just like Joseph. Joseph, when he was around his brothers, they got envious. They got they got distraught. They were they were very um, upset with him. And even his mother and his father even was at one point was like, "Who are you to even say that we will bow before you?" But they didn't even understand their perp. They didn't understand Joseph's purpose. And God had to send him far away from his family, his friends, because God had an assignment for Joseph's life. Joseph had a bigger purpose because in the end, what did Joseph do? He was the one that was the deliverer of his family because he had to. He in the and his family had to seek refuge from where God had placed him because where he was at wasn't the safe place. Where he was at wasn't a part of his purpose because God allowed him to be born and raised there for a certain period of time, but God had to send him. And it's just like Jesus said that a prophet knows no honor in his own household. There's some of you that need to remove yourself from a, from people that don't honor the anointing on your life. There's some of you that need to remove yourself, and I'm not saying remove yourself with disdain or remove yourself with anger or, or resentment towards people because we should always walk in a place of love, but you have to sometime go through a form of isolation so you can understand the vision that God has for your life and even for your family members because Joseph himself had dreams and he had visions and people didn't understand what it is that God was doing in him. And yes, he may have started off being immature or even being prideful because he could have allowed pride to get in, in his heart because now he's going in front of his mother, his father, and he didn't even use any form of, um, you know, like a conscience, like, oh, well, this is my mother and my father. How can I say this in front of him? Not one time the Bible said that. So that could have been that God needed him to go through character building because of his pride, his arrogance, because now he thinks that this is going to be so easy. He just thought that this was just going to happen where he was at, but God had to show him, no, I am the one that's going to show you what I need to show you. I am the one that is going to fulfill your purpose. I am the one that's going to build your character. So a lot of times you might say, why is it that my family or my friends or those that are around me doesn't accept me or doesn't understand my calling, but it's not meant for them to understand it. Because when Joseph, when God placed Joseph in his identity, that is when his family, his friends and everyone else around him understood who he was. Because God sometimes has to protect your identity. And that's the reason why I say prophecy is like a puzzle. God will never allow any man or any woman to know your whole purpose. Because that could be very dangerous. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't agree with me, I know he will convict me. But one thing that I have seen in my personal life, 
God doesn't allow every single person to pray over me. He doesn't allow every single person to speak into my life. And a lot of times when they speak to me, I know it's God because the way that they approach me is always sincere. It's always very humble. They don't try to rush or, or try to force. And that's the reason why I'm telling you that whenever God has called people to your life, it will not be forced. It will not be rushed. It will not be pushed. It won't be somebody that's going to make you feel uncomfortable because God will reveal certain things about you to them and God will reveal certain things about them to you. And that's why a lot of times you will know how to dis um, how to respect them, how to honor them, because you know that God has sent them in your life for a reason, for such a time as this. And some people are in your life for seasons. So at the same time, even when God is revealing your identity, he's not going to allow every single person to understand your full identity. He may, if God does reveal that to one person, trust me, it's not going to be a whole lot of people because that's way too dangerous. If God won't even reveal your full identity to you, why do you feel that some another man or woman that is able to sin or able to fall into covetousness? Why do you feel like God will, will allow anyone to know that full, full, your full identity if he won't even reveal it to yourself because he's protecting you? So a lot of times God can be protecting us. That's the reason why he hasn't shown us everything. Because even though Joseph had dreams and visions and he saw some of it, he saw the goodness. He saw that these people will be bowing before him, but he didn't understand the assignment. He didn't understand the purpose. He didn't understand the rejection, the humiliation, the, the way that he would be sold into, into slavery. He didn't understand that part of it. He didn't understand the process of being able to be in that high position because God had to build his character. God has to, God had to allow him to know, like, you need to depend on me. And I can only imagine with Joshua, he took over from Moses. Can you imagine trying to walk into walk in Moses' shoes? A man of honor, a man that was raised as a as, as a prince. This is who Joshua had to take over, even though God was preparing him and counseling him through Moses' service. He Joshua still had to go through a process. All those years he was walking with Moses, he didn't even think that he, at one point, I'm pretty sure he didn't think he was worthy. He didn't think that he was able to do this. That's why the Bible says he told that, that um, Joshua was told, be bold and courageous. Why would God need to tell someone to be bold and courageous if he himself knew he was bold and courageous? No, God had to speak that into Joshua's life. Be bold and be courageous. Be bold and be courageous. It's some of you that need to be bold and courageous for the assignment that God has for your life. Because it is not by your grace, it is not by your strength, but it is by the Holy Spirit that will empower you to do great and mighty things for his kingdom. So I give God all the glory and all the honor for this word. And I also receive this word for myself in Jesus' name. I give you all the honor and all the glory. Amen.